Greetings, mammalians. For this week, we've got a special guest and an extra bonus segment, which we're calling Vulture's Wake. Christoph, you want to tell us what Vulture's Wake is and introduce our special guest? On Wall Street Wildlife, we're dealing with all kinds of perspectives and wild animals that live on this uh, crazy street of investing. And when I think of a vulture, I think of an, an animal that is bold, it, uh, it's telling it like it is, it's not afraid of the bad news, there's lots of death in, in the jungles. And uh, I've had a really, really educational experience with uh, our resident vulture who goes by Mr. Not Advice. And so I'm beyond thrilled to learn from him and see what he has to say about the state of the world. Uh, so uh, Mr. Not Advice, as our resident vulture, uh, introduce yourself. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for uh, allowing me to come on today as a guest. I very much appreciate it. Yes, uh, my na moniker, Mr. Not Advice, I am the resident vulture. I spent 30 years on Wall Street, uh, ranging in roles from portfolio manager to investment banker. And so what I like to uh, bring and educate uh, the public and investors on is what are the mechanisms going on behind the scenes that affect your money and your investments? I thought it would be good to bring to you today was just an overall commentary on the current market, uh, looking at some of the uh, outlier risks that are there. Uh, first and foremost, I believe the current market is very fragile. Uh, the Fed is propping up the market with helps of the uh, other central banks in the world, primarily Japan uh, and the ECB. I think risk is being ignored, uh, particularly the geopolitical events that are going on in the Middle East, but more importantly to the money uh, uh, market and the investment market is the move by the Japanese central bank. Uh, Japanese central bank effectively decided that uh, yesterday that they have historically attempted to keep interest rates low and they decided yesterday they're going to give up that fight. And by allowing US in, their interest rates to rise, what will happen is they need to sell US debt. And when they do that, US interest rates will go up. And so this is a big deal. If you remember the 2008 great financial crisis, one of the things that made it worse was this, what we would call in the business, a currency war. And that was happening behind the scenes underneath uh, the uh, market uh, action. Uh, I, I like to say it's, the, it's a structural issue. So, you know, if we look at it like a baseball game, I think we're probably only two to the second or third inning uh, of this sell-off. I think right now we have a, a tremendous amount of hopium in the market, a great deal of hope that this time will be different. But when you start dealing with um, central banks, sovereign debt, uh, you start getting into the realm of not being able to stop uh, a runaway freight train. And so not to scare your listeners, but to be prepared and understand as they see some of the news flow coming on. I actually called um, back in September uh, for a 20% drop in the market. If you remember back in September, uh, everyone was euphoric. Uh, the market was going to go up and video was never going to go down. And yet here we are 10% already down. I've adjusted my call due to the central banks, uh, primarily Japan and the US. Uh, I believe we're going to go down another 20% by the end of 2023. And I think that uh, after 2023, there are things happening within the market. I saw a news release uh, just in the overnight that if any of you have seen the movie, The Big Short, you understand what happened there. And quite frankly, uh, effectively what blew up was the, in, the insurance market that banks use to insure one another. And what we're seeing are some of the top tier banks, all of a sudden the cost to insure them is rising quite quickly. And so I keep my ear to the ground, I still have a great deal of contacts that speak to me about what's going on underneath the surface of the market. And 
Uh, I, I'd have to say that right now the risk for contagion or the risk for spreading um, will probably continue to rise, but I haven't seen it at this level since, unfortunately, 2008. Uh, and that's not even bringing into what's going on in the Middle East and if there's an expansion to a regional conflict. So those are the things that I'm keeping my eye on. Tom to dive into. And the, um, the Japan issue, so that's, that's important. Am I right to think Japan's like the largest foreign holder of uh, U.S. Treasuries? So that's why that is correct. Like a, a major... Right. Yeah, that's correct. Japan is the largest holder. And, you know, countries unlike the U.S. who prints dollars at will, um, countries, because they're tied to the dollar, the, the, the world trades with dollars, Japan only has a limited amount of dollars in U.S. debt. And so in order for them to support their own currency, which would help keep their interest rates low, which help keeps inflation low, they will have to sell U.S. debt. And in fact, since two weeks ago, we've seen the Japanese Central Bank make announcements. They've done three different unscheduled bond buying programs. And so they are really trying to lower uh, their interest rate. What I keep an eye on is very simple. I keep an eye on the yen to the U.S. dollar. And anybody can pull it up on Yahoo uh, or CNBC. And as long as it's above 150, uh, that means the central bank will continue to intervene in the market. And uh, I think uh, the best way I think of it is we are reaching the point where no one wants to be the last person out the door. Japan has made the decision. They're not going to allow their economy to be harmed by helping the United States. And that is a big deal. Euro, uh, European markets or the ECB is getting in on the action also, as is Mexico through the peso. So you're starting to see the, the sides being drawn for a currency war, a full-blown one. And that will affect everyday uh, investors uh, in their investments. Mr. Not Advice, is it, is it in the realm of possible? Is this the first step toward a p potential country or economy weaning themselves off the U.S. dollar? I think, you know, after 1940 or after the World War II at uh, Bretton Woods, the, the best thing, or uh, cynically, the worst thing that happened, the U.S. was able to force uh, the world onto the U.S. dollar. So if you want to trade in the world, you must use the U.S. dollar. When I say trade, I'm talking about central banks. I'm talking about actual governments going out and buying supplies. I think that um, Japan being the largest holder and with the U.S. dollar, EU uh, and the British pound, they account for 87 percent of the, the global reserves uh, to trade in. I think when you have and the U.S. alone is 67 percent, which is up uh, in the past 10 years from uh, about 52 percent. And so when you have that size of money, um, I, I, I think that the risk to the market right now and the risk to the average day, average everyday person is that things are going to get more expensive. And it will happen quickly. It will happen in an overnight session. I mean, you're not going to wake up and gasoline is going to be $8. But what you are going to wake up is within three months, all of a sudden, everything that appears to cost more is costing more. Because the only way to fight inflation for the central banks is to drive interest rates down. And in order to do that, you've got to support your own currency. You, you, that is... That is your own debt, you have to do that. Otherwise, um, inflation will start to move up very quickly. And you have to remember Japan for bank accounts was at negative interest rates. So if you put money into a Japanese bank, you had to pay them. Now we're switching. Now they're gonna allow their 10 year bond effectively to rise above 1%. And in fact, they are, in my own opinion, so desperate that they won't even put a cap on anymore. They're saying, we don't know what the cap is. It could be one, it could be one and a half, it could be two. So certainly the ingredients are there for um, a full-blown currency war, and that will directly affect the U.S. stock market. Um, interest rates up means stocks down. And then in terms of the impact on like the everyday U.S. retail investor, um, 
So you're, you're sort of calling for a 20 to 30 percent downturn over the next couple of months from where we are today, if I understood. Mm-hmm. Do, do you think that's sort of equally spread or are there certain categories of types of company or like large caps versus micro caps, which will be a little bit more immune to that, do you think? I think it's going to, you know, across the board, because when you're dealing with interest rates, you're dealing with the borrowing costs for every company. Um, you're dealing with expenses, right? Um, so you're shrinking margins. If a company has to pay more for their interest, uh, for their debt service, they're going to shrink their margins, which then affects their wages. You know, small caps, I think, could get especially hit hard. Technology is, is actually quite interest rate sensitive. Uh, they, they do a lot of business based on debt, um, whether it's in the private equity markets through traditional lending. Uh, and then finally, banks. Uh, I don't think people understand how bad a position some of the major money center banks are right now without dealing with the, the slow uh, explosion of the commercial real estate market. And so there, there is a confluence of events that are happening right now that I believe are equal to, if not greater, than what happened prior to the GFC. Uh, in 2008. This time around, you have also a conflict in the Middle East, a conflict in Ukraine. So um, I I think right now is a time to be nimble. I think right now is a time to be prepared. Um, But I don't think right now is a time to go out and, you know, leveraging one's account and getting super aggressive. Well, there you have it, folks. This is this is this is why we brought a resident vulture to to the animal landscape because as uh, our resident badger and monkey uh, talk about all the time, it's not about being wrong. It's about realizing you're wrong and staying wrong. And I think we need all the time to be as aware of our own prejudices and hopium and optimistic glasses as possible. Uh, And Mr. Not Advice, uh, I think you're doing investors a great service by foregrounding all of the possibilities that are turning into, say, probabilities, right? We never know for sure, right? You could be wrong. Anybody could be wrong. But when you start looking at the evidence, right, and the data. Yeah, I would close with that. I'm not a particularly smart person, but what I do have is 85,000 hours uh, of screen time, watching the markets, um, learning, and um, that experience is what's telling me right now is a very dangerous time, I think, for anybody to get super aggressive. So if folks want to find more of your not advice, they could go on X and look up Mr. Not Advice. And if you are a listener to our Wall Street Wildlife podcast, we hope that our resident vulture will make repeated appearances to keep us updated about the the skull and crossbones he's finding everywhere. <laughs> Thank you very much, you gentlemen. I appreciate it. Our Thank pleasure. You Thank advice. you. Thanks for, thanks for bringing the doom. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Ha ha ha!